Hey everyone, how are you all doing today? Just check my settings here, make sure I am recording and that my audio is working. Somebody type in the Q&A real quickly for me, let me know you can hear me. Would you mind doing that? Zoom is doing its best to bring everybody on, so we'll just be patient for one minute and get going. Thank you, Sarah. She can hear me. Thank you so much. All right. Listen, I'm in such a good mood today. <laughs> I'm really in a fantastic mood. It is gorgeous here in Utah, like 67 degrees. So just perfect weather. And I had a good morning, did some coaching, hanging out, doing the thing I love. Um, I've got a really fun class for you today. So while we're letting everyone come on, I'm just going to take a quick second and introduce myself. For those of you who are new to me, my name is Jane Colpier. I'm a certified life coach through the Life Coach School, and I'm a marriage coach. I love helping people who are deeply unhappy in their relationships, but they don't want a divorce. I find that that's so many people in our population. I know it's a struggle. Marriage is not easy, but there is a way to fix things, to turn them around. I help people not only mend their marriages, but learn to love them all over again. So the reason that I tell you that I was certified with the Life Coach School is because it matters. Um, I know that there are a lot of life coaches showing up on the scene today. And because our industry is an unregulated industry, training really matters. At the Life Coach School, it is a year-long intensive training that really prepares its coaches to help their clients create real and lasting change. We practice something that's caused causal or called causal coaching, which is helping clients to identify the root causes of their struggles, the thinking that's creating the results, and through a very scientific process, we help them fix the problem at the root rather than just re recommending like steps, <clears throat> excuse me, steps to take that give temporary relief to difficult symptoms. So we help you actually rewire your thinking through a very methodical process that allows you to really enjoy your life in a way that you've likely never experienced before. So I'm going to begin today by teaching you the self-coaching model that we use. The model was created by my coach and mentor, Brooke Castillo, as a way of organizing and understanding universal truths. It helps us to understand how and why we're creating the results that we're experiencing in our lives. And we also use it to help us create changes when we're wanting new and different results. So this is the way that the model works. In our lives, we have things that happen. And we call those things, I can get the cap off of my pen, circumstances. Our circumstances are things that are outside of our control. And circumstances are always neutral. So they're things like the degree, the temperature, the weather. It is the number on the scale. It is something words someone else says. It's anything that's beyond our control. That is a circumstance and our circumstances are always neutral. I'm going to do N E U T R A L. I'm going to do my best to write on my board today, but heads up, my writing isn't great. So it's just not my best skill. Our circumstances are always neutral. There are no adjectives. We don't <clears throat> use any descriptive words here. So opinions and um, descriptions about a circumstance are, don't apply. That's just story that we apply to a circumstance. So if we said bad coronavirus, the word bad just doesn't apply. Coronavirus is our circumstance, right? Okay, that's just an example. Then what we have is a thought is triggered by our circumstance. Our brains have a reaction to the circumstance. We have a thought around a circumstance and that thought creates a feeling. So our thoughts create a feeling. Our thought is just a neural, re a neural connection in our brain. Two neurons meet and create a connection, creates a feeling in our bodies. That feeling drives our actions. So all of the actions that we take, we take because of the way that we're feeling. And the actions that we take 
create the results in our lives. And our results are always going to be tied back to the thought that we're thinking. So this is super important to understand about ourselves so that if we don't like the results that we're experiencing in our lives, we can change them by changing this right here, our thoughts about them. Okay. So now that you have kind of a general idea and understanding about how the model works, I'm going to go to your questions. We're going to plug a few of them into the model so that you can gain a better understanding of how it works. So let me just erase this piece of it so that we can add your information to this. Um, I want to give a big thank you to all of those of you who submitted questions. I chose 10 of them to work through with you. Some of your questions were quite similar. So if I don't answer yours specifically, don't worry, because if you're listening to the others, your question should be answered for you. Um, if we have extra time at the end, I will open up the Q&A. We're going to try and stick to about 45 minutes, so I'll watch the clock too. So our first question is from Liz. Liz says, ever since the coronavirus hit, my husband is frequently irritable and doesn't talk much. He says it's because he has a lot on his mind and thinks I should understand. He's always been more of an introvert, but I hate that he's shutting me out. I'm worried too, and I feel like we should be there for each other. So Liz, thank you for your question. My question for you is, why is this a problem for you? When we think we know how other people should respond to any situation, we're outside of our own business. Byron Katie calls it the three businesses, my business, your business, and God's business. And in this case, the coronavirus is God's business. It's outside of all of our control. We have no control over it at all, other than staying away from it, right? So your business is how you respond and what you can control and how your husband or anyone else responds is their business. They get to choose. And you're not liking it will only cause you pain. You're just arguing with reality, right? Let's take a look at the model and see how this plays out for you. So in your circumstance line, we're going to put Corona virus. That's our circumstance and it's neutral. We get to choose how we want to think about it. Your thought is we should be there for each other. Okay. I'm gonna abbreviate a little bit because it just takes a little too long sometimes to write up there. When you have that thought, we should be there for each other, but we're not, I'm gonna add that onto the end because that's where your brain goes. Your brain thinks that you have, you want something that you don't have. I'm guessing that you feel something like resentment or resentful. Now, one of the problems with just answering the Q&A is I don't have all of your information. Maybe you're not feeling exactly, you could be feeling hurt. I'm not sure exactly what your feeling is. I'm going to take my best guess as to how this is playing out for you based on my experience coaching other people. So when you have that feeling of resentment or feeling resentful, most of the time what we do is we do things like we withdraw from our partner or we um, ruminate about how they could be better. So we spend a lot of time in our own brains. So I'm just gonna put ruminate. Or maybe we blame him for our feelings. Okay, so we'll put blame him for your dissatisfaction or your unhappiness, right? And then your result here is I'm not there for him either. Because what happens when you're feeling all of, feeling resentful, we behave in a way that causes a different result for, for us. So I'm not there for him either. Oh, I warned you guys about my, I'm not, about my writing and with good reason. <laughs> so what I would ask you is what if you just allowed him to react any way that he wanted, and you still loved him completely. 
you want to talk more with him and be more engaged with him because of the way that you think it will make you feel. But wanting something that you don't have, you're making yourself miserable and you're feeling resentment. You want to love him. So you can just choose to love him if you want. So my question is for you, and this will be helpful for you, is, is there another way that you can satisfy that need for yourself? If you need conversation, you need human interaction, talking, is there another way that you can satisfy that for yourself? And then I think a good question for you to ask yourself too is, how do I want to feel about my husband? How do I want to feel about him while we're going through this? He's not going to change this piece of him. He is more introverted. He doesn't want to talk about it. So how do I want to feel about him? Do I want to feel angry and resentful? Or is there a different feeling that I want to have about him? So your work is really to find a different thought that creates the feeling that you want to feel instead of making your situation worse by withdrawing and ruminating and blaming him. Okay. All right. Our next question is from Dana. Dana says, I am a stay at home mom and feeling sick to death with homeschooling and housework. For the past few years, my husband and I have grown apart. We are friends, but that is all. I find myself reaching out to other men on social and creating relationships I know are not appropriate. I feel like I'm addicted to these conversations. They make me feel desirable and wanted, and I don't feel that way with my husband. How can I get out of this cycle? Thank you, Dana, for your question. Dana, I think it's really important for you to understand that just like I told Liz, the reason that humans do anything at all is because of the way that it makes us feel. And you actually show really good awareness in knowing that the reason that you're cultivating these friendships is because of the way that you want to feel. So you're exhibiting a behavior <clears throat> that we call buffering. Buffering is a behavior that we engage in when we're trying to avoid feeling a negative emotion. It's our brain's protective way of trying to make us feel better, but it actually creates a net negative effect, meaning that once you've engaged in the behavior, you feel worse or you've created more negative consequences for yourself than you had before. So people do this with drinking alcohol or overeating or compulsive shopping. So my question for you is, what is the feeling that you're trying not to feel? That's, that's the number one thing you've got to discover for yourself. My guess is it's something like disappointment or discouragement or dissatisfaction in your marriage. Once you kind of identify that emotion, then you can get to work on processing that and evaluating who you want to be, how you want to show up, and what you'd like to create in your relationship. In my blog post last week, I made the comment that your relationship is actually supposed to be struggling. And I really believe that is true for all of us at times because it forces us to create change. It forces us to take the action that's necessary in order to create a really incredible relationship. So your behavior of buffering <clears throat> is, is something that we can solve for, for sure. Because what we need to do is take your attention from trying to feel something here to looking at your marriage and generating what you want to feel in your marriage. And I totally believe that's possible for all of you. This is really something I can help you with though, Dana. So I hope you will schedule a free call with me. Um, let's move on to Celia. Celia, yours was quite long, so I'm going to abbreviate a little for everyone um, and just try to kind of recap your message. Celia says she's been married for 24 years and it's always been hard. Her husband doesn't participate in the family and shows no romantic interest in her. She was raised Catholic and he implied that he was religious too, but will not attend church with her or the kids. She started going to a non-denominational church seven years ago, and it was a good change. Sounds like he went to that with you for a little while, but then stopped. Um, he is grumpy, and when she asks him to help around the house, he's, oh, grumpy when she asks him to help around the house. He's been acting mysteriously for five years, and her kids, 14, 21, and 23, are encouraging her to leave him. She says, I'm not being treated well, so please let me know what to do. Okay, Celia. 
there's a lot here and I'm not sure that we can address everything in this setting, but I would really recommend that you ask yourself this question. And that is, why do I want to stay? That's so important for you to know about yourself. Why do you want to stay in the marriage? And then I want you to make a list of all of those reasons. Anyone who stays married has made the choice to stay or they would be divorced, right? So from your email, it seems like you don't want to leave, but then you also present your husband as the villain in your story. And the problem with having a villain is it makes you the victim. And victims don't have any power. So it's super important for you to own your reasons for wanting to stay because that's what gives you your power back. When it's your choice, you own the consequences that you have created by doing that. And then you can have the power to create something di different if you want to. So it sounds to me like you guys have developed some really healthy un or unhealthy patterns of interaction over the years. Um, and now you're just kind of stuck in that cycle, repeating itself over and over. All it takes to change that cycle is one person. So when we have a, a cycle of interaction or a habit of, of interacting in a certain way, it looks like this. Like you can really almost predict your next argument. He does this, I react this way, and then this is the result. So it's kind of like A plus B equals C. And you always know that that's going to be the result. If you ask husband to do something, he gets grumpy and then we fight, right? Okay, something like that. So it all starts with just changing one thought in one partner. And this is really hard for a lot of people to understand. They're like, how do I, how can one person really change it? But if one person changes the interaction and suddenly it's A plus C, now it's going to be a result of D. Like that, that, previous result, it doesn't apply anymore. Once one person changes the equation, it changes the result. So for you, the question is, what's your most painful thought? And I think it's probably something like, he doesn't treat me well. Um, do you see how that thought makes you feel picked on? And I'm not saying that you're not, but what's true is that that thought does nothing to help you out. That thought is filled with lots of expectations, like he should speak or act or show up in a certain way for me. And then when we feel like we need him to be that way in order to feel loved, like we just lose every single time when we are relying on someone else to create the way that I feel. So one of the things that I learned really early on that was really helpful for me, and maybe this analogy will help you, but if you think about a puppy, and why we have pets like we bring these animals home and we just love on them and we only have them so that we can feel love for them um, they do all kinds of things that might upset us like chew on our furniture or potty in the house or you know we've got to buy things for them they do absolutely really nothing to deserve that love yet we expect our partners to do all this stuff in order to deserve our love. And so what I would suggest to you is to start asking yourself, why do I expect that? And if you can get to the point where you just allow your husband to be there and his only purpose is just to show up and to be alive so that you get to feel love for him, I think that would really help you in this situation. You want to feel love so you can generate that by the thoughts that you think about him. Okay, so many of us feel like giving that kind of love isn't fair, that they need to give us equal love in return, but that's just not true. The thoughts that we think are what create our feelings. And so you're the only one in control of your thoughts. So my suggestion for you is really that you find some thoughts that make you feel love for him and stop showing up in this same way in, as, as you're interacting keep that thought in your mind, start looking for things that you appreciate about him. And then when you're tempted to react in a way that feels like a habit for you, see if you can interrupt that pattern, change that interaction, and that will help you to create a new result. Okay. So, okay, let's go to one from Lori. Lori says, I am struggling with intense body pain. I have an issue that is chronic, extremely painful, and it is relentless 24 seven. 
Some days I don't even get out of bed and I feel guilty because I think my husband is losing patience with me. I do my best to keep my chin up, but the pain wears me down. I've been dealing with this for two years and it affects the quality of my life and my relationship. Any help would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate your comment and your question. Listen, when we are dealing, I'm gonna erase this really quickly. When we're dealing with chronic pain or pain of any kind, our pain is our circumstance. So let's take a look at this in the model for you and see how it looks. So we're gonna put in your circumstance, chronic body pain. Okay, and then the thought that you have about your pain can really intensify, intensify your physical pain by adding emotional pain. So for example, when you think the thought, this is relentless, What was the other thought? Um, the pain wears me down. It makes you feel something like maybe hopeless or defeated, right? And when we're feeling hopeless or defeated, we do, we take actions that looks something like maybe we sink into it or we feel really sorry for ourselves or we worry about what husband is thinking or we give up trying, right? I don't know that this is how you're reacting. Again, I'm making kind of an educated guess, but I want you to see that from a feeling of hopelessness or defeat, our actions are not going to be brave. Our actions are not going to be, they're gonna reflect this feeling, okay? So maybe, I'll just write a few of these in here. Sink into it. Maybe give up a little bit. Um, worry about husband. Something like that. And then your result, when you have that thought, this is a relentless and the, and the pain wears me down, your result is I have no control. I have no control over any of it. Okay. So negative emotion on top of physical pain can really double your suffering. If your thoughts about your pain cause you more pain, we're inflicting more pain on ourselves, right? So your thoughts about pain, this is always going to be neutral, even though it really doesn't feel neutral. Believe me, I understand when you're like, no, this is for real. This is just the worst. If you think that it's the worst, and if you think that it's relentless and that it's hopeless, you see that it just makes you feel awful. Feeling awful amplifies your original pain, right? It's finding a different thought that creates a different emotion that will help you handle the physical pain without adding unnecessarily to it. That alone will give you some relief and likely increase your ability to show up in a different way with your husband. So if you have a thought like maybe this is hard, but I can do hard things, something like that, that would give you a different feeling. That would give you a feeling of maybe um, competency or courage, something like that, that would cause you to create a different action and result. Okay. All right. From Melissa, let me erase real quick. Thanks for your patience with my lovely writing, you guys. I understand that's not great. Um, all right, Melissa says, this might be too much information or not appropriate, but I have a question about having sex and being intimate during this time. Melissa, not, not a problem at all. It's just you and me, right? <laughs> so anyway, I get along, she says, I get along pretty well with my husband. And since the quarantine began, I haven't been in the mood for sex. I don't want to let this go on too long. And I want to make sure we stay husband and wife and not just quarantine roommates. But I'm curious what your thoughts are around this. Why is this happening to me? Melissa, you're so not alone. I've heard this from many of my clients. And if you think about it, 
and the way that the model works, it makes perfect sense. I want you to think about this past month or so and what our brains have been focused on. Probably a lot of focus on the news, on the virus, on uncertainty. We've heard a lot about social distancing and about germs and the need for having not having any physical contact. Um, so I want you to think carefully and where have your thoughts been for the past month, maybe month and a half? What have you, where, what have you been thinking about? Where your attention goes, that's where your energy flows. So my guess is you haven't been spending much time, if any, thinking sexy thoughts. Makes sense, right? We've all had kind of this circumstance that we're all freaking out about a little bit. And so attraction and desire are created in your mind. And if you wanna feel more attraction and desire for your spouse, you just need to be more intentional about choosing the thoughts that create that for you. It's totally doable if that's what you want. But listen, I would say to everyone, please don't be judging yourself for feeling the way that you do. Our work is really to become more aware of what we're feeling and why. These are really unprecedented times for all of us and there's no right or wrong way to experience a pandemic. <laughs> this is something none of us have ever experienced before. So it's important to show yourself a little compassion. Just pay attention to the way you're feeling and notice your thoughts that are creating your feelings. The key is really allowing yourself to feel whatever you're feeling without trying to force it away. If you want to create more intimacy with your husband, you can certainly do that, but there's no need to force things either. Maybe, I like saying, maybe this is just the time in our lives when we don't have sex very often, and that's okay. And you don't have to make it mean that your marriage is falling apart. Excuse me. Okay, from Angela. Angela says, I borrowed some money from my parents without telling my husband because I knew he would be upset. But then I decided to tell him because it felt dishonest to keep it from him. He's very angry with me and says I betrayed him. I told him I love him and I'm sorry and I would never do anything to betray him. But he's not talking to me now, so now I'm getting angry with him. I'm frustrated and it seems like we're at an impasse. Help. Okay, Angela. So what's happening here is you did something, borrowed money from your parents, and your husband was upset. And now you're upset that he's upset. So let's take a look at your model and see what this looks like for you. So in your circumstance, your circumstance is you borrowed some money from parents. Ugh. Okay, and your thought was, I apologized so he shouldn't be angry anymore. Okay, I apologized, I said sorry, he should be over it, right? And your feeling is anger or frustration. Sounds like frustration from your email to me. So when you're feeling frustrated, how do you show up with your husband? This is the question we always have to ask ourselves. When we're feeling a certain feeling, if feeling a certain emotion, how do we act? How do we behave? How do we show up? And for you, you're getting mad. So you get mad at him. Get mad at him. Maybe you act frustrated or maybe you disengage. Perhaps you stop showing affection. Disengage, withdraw, affection. So when we're frustrated and we start showing up this way, your result is you don't forgive him for being angry. So if you notice, your result is really tied right back to your thought. You apologized. You said you think he shouldn't be angry. You think he should forgive you. 
And your result now is you don't forgive him because he's not forgiving you, right? You're both angry. <laughs> so the biggest thing that will give you relief here is if you stop blaming your husband for the way that you're feeling. Right now, you're blaming him. You're like, this is happening and I'm feeling horrible and it's his fault. So you really need to own your piece of this. You really need to own your part of it and understand that he gets to react any way that he needs to react. He's an adult. He gets to choose that, right? Sometimes we want people to react a different way when they're reacting to something that we've done, but that we don't have any control over that. And nor should we have control over that. You would not want someone having that control over you, right? How do you want to feel about your husband? If it's love and understanding, your work is really to find the thought here that creates love and understanding for you. So he was upset about something you did, and now you're upset about something he's doing. You guys actually have a lot in common, right? You kind of understand each other. Okay, let's move on from Cassie. Cassie says, my husband started a side business two years ago and he spends more than he makes. He has a business credit card that we have to pay with our own personal money. I want to be supportive, but I'm angry that he's spending money frivolously and it affects our family. I don't want to pay interest on this card or have to use our savings to pay it off. What do I do when his actions harm our family? Okay, Cassie, thanks for your question. Right now, you're so focused on what your husband's doing that you're completely missing out on watching yourself and your own thinking. When it comes to money, I think a lot of people can relate to this. Most couples come from completely different backgrounds or they have different perspectives surrounding money, how it should be made, how it should be managed, how it should be spent or saved. I know my husband and I had completely different financial backgrounds and different ideas around money. And that's okay. It's not a problem unless we make it a problem. It's completely normal actually. But the problem comes when we make one partner right and the other partner wrong. So I want you to consider this. What if you're both right? Is it possible for you to consider that that is a possibility? You have judgment that he's spending the money frivolously and that is your opinion, right? When we, we couldn't put spending money frivolously in the C line because frivolously is an adjective. It's a descriptive word and everything in the circumstance line is neutral, right? So what we would do is we'd put up here in the circumstance line, we would put the business card balance. And I don't know your balance, but you can do this at home. So the balance on the business credit card is what, right? And then your thought, about that balance is he is spending money frivolously. So he is spending frivolously. Whoops, frivolously, there you go. Okay, so um, when you have that thought that he's spending frivolously, it makes you feel angry. How do you show up with him when you're angry? How is this playing out in your marriage? Again, I don't really know because I don't have that information from your um, submission, but my guess is maybe you talk, maybe you're a little short with him. Um, maybe you think about it and stew about it and ruminate, or you bring it up a lot. You withdraw affection. This, these are very common things that we do when we're angry in our relationships together. We usually end up withdrawing some type of affection. We stew a lot on our own. We're inside our own heads a lot. And your result really is that you're letting and I should always put I here because your result is always yours. Your result is never going to be someone else's. So you just want to know what you're creating for you. So your result is I am letting money separate us or come between us.
Okay, so when you think that thought, he's spending money frivolously, you don't like the way that he is taking care of the money, but what you're letting money do is come between you, okay? You're getting irritated and focusing on your husband. You're focusing on what he's doing and what he's not doing. And when you do this, you're really not focusing on anything that you can do. You're simply making yourself at the effect of him. Okay, so when you do that, again, we're making ourselves the victim, right? Um, how can you tell this story in a way that serves you better? How can we think about this? How is it possible that this particular challenge could actually bring you guys closer together? I can see a way for that happening. If you don't want the result that you're letting money cause separation between you, you need to find another way of thinking about the situation that doesn't make you angry. And so for everyone, when you jump, when you choose a new thought, it needs to be one that's really believable for you. If you jump to, oh, he's spending money like crazy and I love it, of course your brain's gonna reject that. Your brain's gonna say, no, that's not true and I don't believe that at all. So we want to, Find something else. We're not going to say, I'm so happy we're in debt. But what we need to do is just take a little step up, a little, uh, find a ladder thought. We call them a ladder thought that provides a little bit of relief. So maybe in this situation, it's something like, it's possible that this is exactly how much he's supposed to be spending right now on his business. Maybe I don't know how it's all going to play out. It's possible that he needs to be, that he knows what he's doing right? Can you see how we're not agreeing that the money is, is being all the way spent well, but we're just saying, maybe I don't have to be completely right. Maybe this is a situation where he has a learning, where he has a lot of learning to do, or maybe this is a lesson that will save us from another hardship down the road that we'll have to get through together. So there's lots of ways that you can think about it. You just have to find one that feels right for you that provides you with a little bit of relief. So I don't really know what that thought is for you, but if you want to find it, you can. And always, if you want to jump on a free call with me, I'd be happy to help you sort that out and, and find that for yourself. Okay. From Michelle, Michelle says, the thought of sex with my husband disgusts me. It's not my sex drive, it's my lack of attraction to him. We haven't had sex in years and I don't wanna bring it up with him because I actually don't wanna start having sex with him again. But it's the elephant in the room for me and I feel like I'm holding on to this big secret which does not feel good. Okay, Michelle. Thank you for being brave. I know it isn't easy to share this kind of stuff, and I'm, that's why I'm not using your last names. I want to honor your anonymity. But listen, if you, you talk about this like it's just something that happens to you, like you don't have any control over it, like you're just noticing the fact that you're not attracted to him. But here's the truth. Disgust is created by your thoughts, and attraction is created by your thoughts. You could change both of these by thinking different thoughts if you want to. So the real question for you is, what do you actually want for your marriage? This is a choice that you've made, but it sounds like you're not quite comfortable with your choice to not have sex with your husband ever again. So here are some more questions I want you to think on. Why is it an elephant in the room? Do you want your marriage to be different? And if so, why? And how do you want it to be different? What is your fear if you don't make the change or make a change, right? I, I think becoming really clear about what you want for yourself and the future of your marriage is the best place for you to start. Because you can absolutely change this if you want to. I work on we talk about sex all the time in my, in my coaching because this is a very common issue that a lot of couples have. They want to improve that part of their relationship together and it all starts in your brain. It really all is in your brain. You're the one that created these feelings for yourself and that really is the best news ever because that means that you can create something entirely different if you want to. So thank you for your question. Okay, from Claire. Claire says, I am new. Oh, sorry. I am in a new second marriage and I'm very happy with my new husband. 
We were friends for some time before we started dating, and I'm also friends with his ex, who I also love. She's great. That's in parentheses. Um, the problem is she and my husband have remained good friends since their breakup. And even though he says it would never happen, I worry about them getting back together again. Because like I said, she is great and also very pretty. Whenever I see her, I'm overcome with jealousy and I hate it. I know this is my problem and I don't want them to, and I want them to have a good relationship, but I'm also so afraid of losing him. I don't, oh, sorry. I feel petty and childish but I don't know how to stop feeling this way. I don't want to, I don't want to mess up my new marriage. Please help. Okay, Claire, let's take a look at your model. I think it'll help to show you what you're creating with your thinking in this situation. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of awareness just to see it on paper or in this case, my whiteboard. So your circumstance is husband is friends with his ex. Husband, friends, with X. Okay, and your thought is something like, she's amazing, maybe he will want her back, right? You see it, you see how great she is. So your brain is giving you lots of evidence for why this would be true. Yeah, our brains love to be right. So when we have a thought like this and it's very painful, it even though it causes us pain, it likes to be right even more. So then it will gather up all this evidence of why she's amazing. And you're looking for it every time you see her. And that thought, she's amazing, he might want her back, makes you feel jealous. So when you feel jealous, how do you show up with him? That's always the question we're gonna ask. What do you do when you're around him? So for you, I'm guessing that it looks like you worry a lot about what he's thinking or what might happen. Maybe you resent their friendship. Oops. Um, maybe you act a little bit needy or you act a little jealous with him. Sometimes we act really crazy when we have that feeling of jealousy, right? So I'm just gonna put act needy. Um, maybe you seek extra reassurance, or maybe you even confide in other friends. Often when we're feeling jealous and we don't dare discuss it with the husband, maybe we talk to someone else, talk to our friends about it. So when you have all of these actions, because you're feeling jealous and because you're having that thought, your result is going to be, you make it harder for your husband to see how amazing you are because you're not acting very amazing, right? So you make it hard, I make it hard for Hub. Listen to me abbreviate in my speech. <laughs> okay. I think it's interesting, don't you? Like this is completely an unintended result. These are just a thought, this is just a thought that you're thinking that makes you feel a certain emotion that causes you to act in a way that you don't really want to. So becoming really aware of this thought will be super helpful for you. You need to um, really understand too that as women, we're so cruel when we insist on comparing ourselves to other people. We compare our flaws to other women's best features is so unfair. So of course he loves you, Claire. So tell me why. I want you to take some time today to really journal that. Why does he love you? Write it all down. Take a look at it on paper. See the evidence right in front of you that he loves you, right? Right now your focus is on all the reasons why she is lovable. And that's creating a lot of pain for you. So you need to take a look at yourself, put the focus back to you. How are you lovable? What does your husband find attractive for you? Stop allowing your brain to give, you any, give her any more attention at all. Just put your brain to work on finding evidence of why you are lovable and why you're incredible and why he married you. 
anytime your brain tries to wander back to her, you just take control and say, stop, we're not thinking about her anymore. Okay. Loving yourself more is really the key. And when you really fall in love with yourself, you can love everyone else without indulging in unnecessary worry. In my 12 week program, we spend a whole week on this very thing on loving yourself and learning how to really fall in love with you. Okay. Let's see. We're running out of time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and check the Q&A, see if there's anything. Okay. Listen, um, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope it's been helpful for you. If I didn't get to your question and you want further help from me, please go to my website. It is janecopier.com. Copier is that funky Dutch name. It's spelled just like copier. So it's janecopier.com. And you can schedule a free call with me. Um, if you've liked what you learned today and you'd like to get even more help from me, I have an excellent 12 week coaching program. It has weekly classes that you take online and then homework that go along with them. And, but the real value is having that weekly one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me where we dig into your own brain. I help you see your thinking and help you change it in a very systematic and methodical manner and help you really create the relationship that you've always dreamed of. So listen, if you're thinking, yeah, this is something I'd really like to do, but I'm not sure I can handle it. I'm doing my best right now during the coronavirus to make it as affordable as possible. Listen, you deserve a coach. You have invested in everyone else in your life. You've paid for all of your kids' activities and trips and everything, for tutors, for college, for all of it. You've helped everyone but yourself. So now it's your turn. So really, if you've had enough and you want real change, I just invite you to sign up for a free phone call with me and let's see if we're a good fit. Now's the time to do it. If not now, then when, right? You don't want to keep suffering year after year. You can take action and make it better. I truly would have given anything to learn these tools sooner. I enjoy my husband so much now. I would love to have those years back. So yes, coaching is an investment, but isn't your marriage worth it? Seriously, what could be more important? My clients have experienced incredible results through coaching, and you really can too. There's no topic that's too hard, nothing that we can't work through together. So if this tugs at your heart, and you really want it so much you can taste it, let's get to work. You're exactly the one I want to work with. I want you to be all in and ready to go. I promise to make our time the best investment that you'll ever make. And you can have that happily ever after. You can be a great example for your kids. This work has generational consequences. It's the best gift that you can give to your family and to yourself. So go to my website and sign up for your free minute session and stay healthy, everyone. Stay away from that nasty virus and be patient and just hug your loved ones extra tight. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you all have a beautiful day.